Hello everybody, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at aortic coarctation for finals. So just a little bit about the medicine guide. So the medicine guide aims to support medical students throughout their entire journey at medical school. So I've made videos about how to be successful in the pre-clinical years at medical school, how to be successful during the clinical years at medical school, how to get the most out of GP placements, how to get the most out of hospital placements, how to succeed in your clinical OSCEs. And I've also got a paediatrics edition focused on a child with a mass for finals, a vomiting child for finals, congenital heart disease for finals, high yield rashes for finals, limping child for finals, and high yield genetic conditions for finals. I also have an obs and gynae range such as looking at chronic abdominal pain for finals, gynecological cancers for finals, acute abdomen for finals, obstetric emergencies for finals, and SDIs for finals. Now this video can be used in conjunction with my numerous other videos as part of the cardiology edition. So I've got a video on atrial fibrillation for finals, pleuritic chest pain for finals, infective endocarditis for finals, aortic coarctation, which is this video today, and high yield electrolyte disturbances with ECGs for finals. So without much further ado, let's get started. So the outline for today's video is that we're going to be starting off by discussing what are the types of aortic coarctation, and then we're going to look at the risk factors, and then the signs and symptoms, tests and investigations, and then finally the management. So let's begin. So what are the different types of aortic coarctation? So there are two types of aortic coarctation. There's the postductal or adult type form of aortic coarctation. And then there's a preductal aortic coarctation. And sometimes this is known as the infantile type. So the infantile type or the preductal form of, a, of aortic coarctation is the most common form it presents in 70% of cases, whereas the postductal or adult type aortic coarctation only presents in 30% of cases. So if you have a look at this diagram, and if you look on the far right hand side, that gives an example of preductal aortic coarctation. So that's describing how the aortic arch has a degree of constriction, and this constriction is occurring prior to the ductus arteriosus. So in preductal aortic coarctation, there's narrowing or a constriction of the aorta prior to the ductus arteriosus. Now, if you have a look on the left-hand side, you can see an example of postductal aortic coarctation. In postductal aortic coarctation, the narrowing, the constriction of the aorta is after the ductus arteriosus. Okay, so just keep that in mind as we move forward with the topic today. So let's look at risk factors. So the first risk factor for aortic coarctation is unfortunately it's more common in males. Turner syndrome is a major risk factor for aortic coarctation and Turner syndrome is a condition that's suffered exclusively by girls and if you want to find out more about Turner syndrome then please check out my video on high yield genetic conditions for finals where I explain that in much greater detail. A bicuspid aortic valve is a risk factor for aortic coarctation. Berry aneurysms are a risk factor for aortic coarctation, and if the berry aneurysm should rupture, then it can lead to a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and eventually this would lead to a hemorrhagic stroke. So berry aneurysms is something that's very concerning in these patients. And neurofibromatosis is another risk factor for developing aortic coarctation. Okay. So now let's focus on signs and symptoms. So let's start off with the preductal or infantile form of aortic coarctation. 
So like I mentioned previously, it's when you've got the narrowing and the constriction of the aorta prior to the ductus arteriosus. So the name is a giveaway, so infantile form. So it's commonly found in very, very young infants and typically found in neonates. So neonates can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. Now, the majority of the time they will be symptomatic, but I just want to make you aware of the cases where they may be asymptomatic. So if the neonate is asymptomatic, that's because the degree of constriction of the aorta, the, so the degree of the coarctation isn't severe. Or it might be in a situation where the ductus arterius has remained open. Now, the majority of neonates will be symptomatic and they'll present with the formless symptoms. So they'll present with shock, collapse and heart failure. So these symptoms will typically present on the second day of life because usually on the second day of life, this is when the ductus arterius closes. Now, a murmur that is associated with aortic coarctation is a late systolic murmur in the left infraclavicular area and the scapula. Now, this murmur isn't something that crops up in medical school final exams as commonly as other murmurs do, but it's just something that I think you should be aware of. Okay, so now let's look at the postductal aortic coarctation or adult form aortic coarctation. So this is when you've got the constriction of the aorta, you've got the coarctation of the aorta after the ductus arteriosus. So patients will present with a blood pressure which is higher in the upper extremities, so that's in the arms, compared to the blood pressure in the lower extremities, so that's their legs. So you might find in some books that it's described classically as upper extremity hypertension, which means the same thing as having a blood pressure in the upper extremities greater than the blood pressure in the lower extremities. Okay. So like we've mentioned before, patients are at risk of aortic coarctation if they have a history of berry aneurysms. And similarly, it's a double-edged sword. So patients who have aortic coarctation are then at risk of developing a berry aneurysm. And that would lead to an intracranial aneurysm and eventually lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage and ultimately lead to hemorrhagic stroke. So it's quite important that berry aneurysms are investigated for thoroughly. Patients will also present with leg claudication. There will also be a radial radial pulse delay. So during your general examination as part of a cardiac exam, when you're palpating the left radial pulse and the right radial pulse, it's important that both of the pulses can be palpated at the same time, that there isn't a delay in the pulsation. If there is a delay in the pulsation, and it's quite a prolonged delay, then that would suggest a radial radial pulse delay, and that's found classically in aortic coarctation. And a murmur associated with adult form aortic coarctation is an ejection click systolic murmur in the left extra capsular area. Again, this murmur isn't very high yield compared to other murmurs, but it's something to be aware of. And just to clarify, postductal and adult form aortic coarctation, again, the name is a giveaway. It's found classically in adults. Now, a very classic sign of aortic coarctation in both the infantile form or the adult form is a patient presenting with a weak or absent femoral pulse. So in your SBA, if it states anywhere that the patient, regardless of their age, is presenting with a weak or absent femoral pulse, that should switch off the light bulb in your mind and it should make you think immediately that this patient is presenting with aortic coarctation. It's a very classic high yield sign of aortic coarctation. Okay. So now let's look at the tests and investigations. So if your patient is presenting with a preductal or infantile form of aortic coarctation, it should ideally have been picked up during the antenatal ultrasound scans. 
um, we can also perform an ECG and chest x-ray. Now I want to focus on chest x-ray in a bit more detail. So a patient with a preductal or the infantile form of aortic coarctation will present with signs of heart failure and cardiomegaly on the chest x-ray. Now the adult type form is something that's more interesting and is more likely to come up in exams. So the adult type aortic coarctation or postductal aortic coarctation will present on a chest x-ray with a figure of three sign. So if you have a look at this chest x-ray, you can see that there's a slight bulge at the right upper aortic knuckle and it's highlighted by this red squiggly line. So that red squiggly line is trying to emphasize the figure of three sign. So the figure of three sign is when there's a postanotic dilation of the descending aorta. Now, personally, I think it's quite difficult to see the figure of three sign on a chest x-ray. So I don't think that this is something that you'll be expected at finals levels to identify on a chest x-ray. However, I think it's quite easy for the examiner to give a description of the figure of three sign within the SBA question. And so you'll be expected to understand that, yes, the figure of three sign is classic of an aortic coarctation. And you'll be expected to deduce that. So I'd say just be aware of the sign. If you can't see it immediately, uh, don't worry about it. And another x-ray finding, which is classic for aortic coarctation, is inferior rib notching and I think this is much much easier to see. Again I don't think this is something that they would particularly expect you to infer straight away from a chest x-ray however they might describe it within the actual question itself and then they would give you a list of possible diagnoses to pick from and again if you hear any sort of description relating to a figure three sign or inferior rib notching then that should switch on the light bulb in your brain and make you think of aortic coarctation. So in some texts, I've seen it described as the Rosler sign, but I think that's quite an outdated and old fashioned term. I've seen books more recently describe it as inferior rib notching, um, but I've just included Rosler sign there just for completion. But I think inferior rib notching is what they're using nowadays as more common terminology. Uh, but just be aware of Rosa sign. So if you have a look at the chest x-ray in the far right hand side, if you look where the arrows are, if you look at the inferior border of that rib and you just try to follow it with your eyes, you can see that it isn't a completely smooth curved finish, that the inferior aspect of that rib is actually quite ragged in some areas. It's not a smooth curve. It almost looks as though it's been, sounds a bit strange, but it looks almost as though the inferior aspect of that rib has almost been nibbled upon. It's not a smooth curve. And that's really what inferior rib notching is. Okay. And you can also perform an echocardiogram. And finally, you can perform a CT angiogram to complete your investigation for aortic coarctation. Now let's look at the management. So I've separated the management and I'm going to be focusing initially on the preductal or the infantile form of aortic coarctation, and then I'll look at the postductal or adult form of aortic coarctation. So initially, we want to give the neonate because it's classically going to occur in a neonate or potentially a very young infant. We want to give IV prostaglandin infusion to help maintain that patency of the ductus arteriosus. And ultimately, we are going to perform surgery. So we're going to perform a balloon dilation. And in some textbooks, you'll see it described as a balloon angioplasty. It means the same thing. So balloon dilation, balloon angioplasty are interchangeable terms, but I've included both just so you won't be caught, sorry, you won't be caught off guarded on exam day. And eventually we're going to perform a ligation of the ductus arteriosus. Now, look at at the adult form aortic coarctation or the postductal aortic coarctation. 
we need to perform a similar surgery and again it's going to be called balloon dilation or balloon angioplasty depending on what books you read. So I've got here a picture of aortic coarctation on the far left hand side and if you look on the far right hand side you can see an example of balloon angioplasty or balloon dilation so a catheter is inserted into the aorta and at the end of the catheter you can see that there's a balloon and this balloon is inflated to help push out that coarctation and to help improve the patency of the aorta and ultimately resolve the, the narrowing and the constriction that was there before. Okay. So that's the end of my video today. So if you enjoyed my video, then please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and please share my videos. So I wish you all the best with your exams. Thank you very much for watching today.